Welcome artists of Wyoming and beyond. Today we'll be embarking on a creative journey to capture the vibrant essence of the colorful Western Tanager on paper. We're joined by a special guest with the National Museum of Wildlife Art today, who will be providing tips to help your art soar like the Western Tanager itself. Why the Western Tanager, you may ask? Well, it's the species selected for this year's Collectible Conservation Stamp Art Contest, hosted by the Wyoming Game and Fish Department and sponsored by the Wildlife Fund. Students from Wyoming who enter the contest have a chance to win $150. So stay tuned to not only draw a beautiful bird, but hopefully earn a pretty penny for your artwork. I'm Chris Martin with the Wyoming Game and Fish Department. And now I'd like to introduce our guest, Jane Lavino, who is the Sugden Chief Curator for Education at the National Museum of Wildlife Art in Jackson. Jane, take it away. Thank you, Chris. Hey, everybody. Welcome and glad you could join us today. I'm here in the classroom at the National Museum of Wildlife Art in Jackson, Wyoming. And during our time together, we're going to do some drawing. We're going to look at some artwork uh, from artists in our museum's collection for inspiration. And we're also going to look at some photographs of the subject, Western Tanager. So yeah, go to our first slide here. And you can see uh, way to the left there is a photograph by a Jackson photographer, Tom Mangelson of the Western Tanager. And we had some kids um, a few years ago before we even knew about this contest doing their own interpretations of that work of uh, that photographic work. So I thought that was a good place to start. And we can go to the next slide, Chris. So this is a good time if you haven't already had a chance to gather up your art materials, go grab some sheets of white paper, uh, typical copy machine type paper, eight and a half by 11 inches is what we want. If you're gonna enter the contest, it has to be those exact dimensions. If you don't have that right in front of you, you know, don't worry about it. This could be a practice or you could cut down your paper to match. I would say grab a few sheets up to about five. We won't need any more than that. And then get a regular graphite pencil and an eraser and some colored pencils, especially red, yellow, orange, and black, which are really important to the colors of the plumage on the tanager. So, uh, and then the last thing I put down there was a, a black fine line marker or pen. Um, anything you have that's a fine line marker um, will work. I have here with me a Micron pen size 02, which will be great. But if you don't have that, don't worry about it. And then, the, the, you know, the, the rules, we're going to take a look at the rules here. And these are all in the booklet that if you go online for Wyoming Game and Fish and you look up for this Tanager contest, you're gonna see these rules. But the, for this particular art contest, the bird should be anatomically correct. That means the wings in the right position, the tail, the right length, uh, the colors correct, the features, the beak in the right place and the beak the right length and so on. Also ecologically correct, meaning in its natural habitat. And just so you know, these birds are typically seen in forested areas, usually conifer, which is cone producing trees, the evergreens, uh, or mixed conifer deciduous, which would mean, you know, there's a mixture of trees, some deciduous like cottonwoods or like aspen trees could be mixed in there. Uh, let's see, they, the birds are often seen at the top of trees, but not always. So think about that. I want to talk a little bit about original artwork, what that means. Of course, the first thing people think about when they hear it has to be original artwork is they think, well, that means I do it myself. I'm not going to have my art teacher help or my one of my parents help me or my older brother or sister or whatever. Um, that's true. You have to do the artwork yourself. But even more beyond that, we want you to think about not copying another artist's work. So that means if you see a work of art that I share on the slides today from an artist in our collection and you like it, you can get inspired by it, but you cannot copy it exactly. Uh, same thing for a photograph. If you find a photograph that we look at today that you like, or you find another one online or in a book, 
you can't copy it exactly unless it's your photograph, unless you took the photograph. What you can do is use it for reference, but change things. You might like something in it, but add your own touch, add your own background. If the bird's in the same position, you're gonna maybe add a several birds or create a different background, but it should be your original artwork. It shouldn't look like anyone else's artwork when it's done. We mentioned the size of the paper already and horizontal format. So that just means hold your paper um, horizontally, not vertically, horizontally. Okay, I think we can go to the next slide. So next we're gonna do some warm up drawing. So just grab one of your pieces of paper, grab your pencil and I want you to, we're gonna switch the camera to me. We're gonna do a series of circles, ovals and wing shapes and tail shapes. Um, but let's start drawing together. So first I want you to draw some circles, okay? And notice that I'm letting my pencil go, whoops, <laughs> there, now you can see it. Notice I'm moving my entire arm around when I'm making a circle. I'm not being cramped up doing something like this. I want my entire arm to move. Try big circles, try circles inside of circles. This is just a warm up more circles and notice how my whole arm is moving like it's a almost like it's a lever it's an extension i'm not getting really cramped up here and i'm not just keeping my hand in one place and drawing i'm moving my whole arm circles more circles okay now i want you to switch and start making some ovals and so it kind of looks like that maybe make a a long skinny oval, something like that. Make an oval going the other direction, like that. Maybe one on its side, like that. And notice again, my whole arm is moving. And you can go around it more than once. This is, you can always erase your guidelines. So you can have them overlap. Make a bunch of ovals again for this warm up. Okay, next we're going to make some oval wing shapes. So we're going to go kind of like a long stretched out oval that is rounded up on the shoulder and it gets kind of pointed down towards the edge. I'm going to do another one, rounded up at the shoulder, pointed down at the edge. It almost looks like a teardrop, right? But that's our wing shape we're going to practice. Do a few more of those. Do one that's even longer and pointier, maybe like that. Okay. And then now we're going to do some, um, almost a, what would you call it? An oblong shape that might be a tail shape. Watch how I do that. Almost like a U, I'm making a U, but a long stretched out U. Okay, do you feel warmed up? You ready to go? Okay, so we're gonna go to the next slide now, and we're gonna talk about the parts of the bird. So basically, whenever you're drawing something, and I do this myself, you're gonna be looking for the basic shapes. So if you look at this slide, you'll see on the left, there is a, carving of some two bluebirds. I know it's bluebirds, it's not tanagers. We don't happen to have any tanagers in our collection. So I chose for inspiration some other songbirds, but it works when we're talking about the anatomy because the anatomy is the same. So if you look at that bluebird, you start to see the wingtip, you can see the tail and how you know, the shape of the tail, long skinny U like we were drawing, you can see um, look at the V between the tip of the wing and the tip of the tail. Do you see that in the negative space between the wing and the tail? Uh, now look at the map of a bird off to the right, and you'll see that the wing, in fact, has two different parts. That dark blue is the primary feathers. Those are the long feathers that hang out and go to a point. And then up on the shoulder, it says coverts. That's almost like a shoulder patch of other feathers that aren't quite as long that sit above. You'll also notice um, 
you know, where the beak sits, where the eye sits relative to the beak. How, you know, look at the legs, see where they come out of the belly, see how they come out at about a 45 degree angle. Um, these are all, you know, things that are fairly common in the songbirds. So we're going to, you know, like I said, we can look at a variety of birds and see the same thing. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, now you're going to get a fresh piece of paper. And if you look to the left, you'll see that the first two basic shapes you're going to draw to form this bird are a circle for the head. And you might be saying, but the head's not a perfect circle on that bird I'm looking at. Don't worry about that. We can refine the shapes, but it's roughly a circle, right? So we're going to draw a circle. And then below that, we're going to draw an oval, which starts on the body. So we're going to switch now to the camera, which will show me drawing. And we're going to draw, like I said, the circle, which will be the bird's head. And then we're going to draw... I'm going to slide this down so you can see the oval, which will be the bird's body. And, you know, if you want to do a few different birds, you don't have to just have one bird in your picture. You could have two birds sitting next to each other, facing the same way, the oval. Um, you could have, it's, this is just practice to start out with, right? So, okay, got that? Uh, let's go back to the slide maybe with the, that showed the reference. There we go. So you, again, you can look at, think about where the bird might be sitting. Maybe one's higher. If you have two birds, maybe one's higher on the branch, one's lower on the branch, but maybe you just want one bird. Um, and then now let's go to the next slide. I bet everybody has that on their paper already. So the next thing we're going to draw is on the, on the right side of the circle, you're going to draw a small triangle for the beak. And then um, on the oval, you're going to draw the two long, thin shapes that become the wing and the tail. So in this picture, I'm only seeing one wing and I'm seeing the tail, right? So you can go back to your circle and you can say, okay, I'm going to draw the beak. The beak is a triangle that comes off to the side maybe like that. And then you can say, okay, I remember drawing those practice wing shapes. There was a shoulder up here, and then it kind of went down the wing to a, to a point, kind of like, kind of like that. So there's my wing shape. And then there was a tail shape, right? And what's the angle of the tail? It kind of goes back. Remember we said a long skinny U shape for the tail? It kind of opens up wider right here where it joins the body and it's narrower down there. So we've got our head, we've got our beak, we've got a wing shape with the shoulder tapering down to the point of the wing, and we've got our tail. And if you have a, another bird, you might want to go over and do the same thing on that one. We've got a beak, we've got maybe this wing's pointing a slightly different direction here. And then we've, again, we've got our tail about at a 45 degree angle. That feels too long. Don't hesitate to use your eraser if you want. There's an artist in our collection named Robert Bateman, and he used to be a, a school art teacher. And he told me he used to tell his students, in order to get good at drawing, you have to make at least a thousand mistakes. So get started. So don't be afraid to make mistakes and erase. Okay, feeling pretty good about that? We can go to the next slide. And on this slide, we're going to start adding a little bit more outlines and details and so forth. So we're gonna, in other words, I'm gonna come back in. Now you can start using your eraser too, but you can start to come in and erase some of these unnecessary lines that make it confusing. So for example, if you go to your head, I'm gonna get rid of the top of that oval that kind of went into the head. I don't need that. I'm gonna do the same on this bird over here since I decided to have two birds side by side. And I'm gonna come into the wing and I'm gonna erase that little section there because I want the wing to be its own thing. I don't want to be able to see through it to the back of the bird. 
And, you know, I, I made my ovals with a lot of round and round lines. I'm going to get rid of some of those round and round lines because those were just guidelines. I don't need them anymore. Same thing down here. Okay. Same thing here. I just want, now it's time to like decide which line you like and smooth it out. Okay. I don't want, I don't really want this line here or this line here. Okay. Now think about with the beak, you're going to start adding some details. See how I'm adding a triangle, kind of another opposite triangle coming back into the face of the bird. I'm going to do the same thing here and here. And really look at the position of the eye. Where is the eye? It's not way up here above the beak, but it is above kind of where the, like if there's a line here across the beak where the beak can open, the eye is above that. And it's back about here, right? So you can add the eye. I'm going to do it on both of my birds. Okay. Yeah, I'll go back to that reference and look at where the eye is. Next, I'm going to come in. I'm going to outline where the red, that reddish orange color is on this bird. So it kind of starts up here near the top of the head and it comes down to the neck and kind of, I'm going to make it look ruffly like that. And it comes like almost a V down on the chest. Because I want to, when I get to coloring, I'm going to want to remember where where that red section around the head is. Kind of like that. Again, kind of makes a V down here. It comes up like that. Remember, you're going to come in with colored pencils, so you don't need to do a lot of shading right now. Now let's look at the wing. I'm glad Chris went back for a second to show us the wing because... Do you see if you look, and it might be hard on the computer to see this, but if you have a good close-up view of that, you'll start to see individual feathers and you'll see what's called the wing bar, which is the colorful bars. Look at the, do you see a yellow patch up on the wing that kind of goes almost like a, uh, almost like a stripe across the, the yellow wing bar? And then there's another kind of bar on below it that is a colorful bar of color here too, right there. And the wing, I'm going to, I'm liking this wing better than this wing. This wing is weird. I'm going to change it. And you can do that too. If you don't like the position, I want the wing to point a little bit more back like that on mine. It's, um, you can always refine things. And I'm noticing that on the wing itself, where those primary feathers are, I'm seeing some lines showing individual feathers. I'm seeing under this wing bar, do you remember that there were the primary feathers and then there was, uh oh, I'm going to forget the name of the shorter feathers. The Maybe some of you remember that name from that map. Uh, but you can see there's an upper shoulder patch of the wing feathers. You can sometimes see the lines distinguishing extra feathers there. And same thing on this one. I'm going to do the, the shoulder patch of wing feathers, which is shorter, and the longer wing feathers here. And then I'm going to try to remember that there's a patch of yellow here and a patch of yellow on the tips of these wing feathers as well. And this is also the time to come back and refine. You can refine things by saying, okay, I want the shape of the head comes down here. The back of the bird kind of comes down like that. So I've got the back of the bird. I've refined that a little bit. I want to look at the tail and look really closely. And I can see that the tail actually isn't one solid piece. It's made up of several feathers as well. Okay, so getting there. I'm liking it a little better now. Again, erase any lines you don't feel like you need anymore. If you feel like the, the chest isn't plumped out quite enough, you can plump it out more. I'm feeling like that's true here. Look at that chest and see how it's puffed out. You know, when they're singing, they puff out their chest. 
and that's looking this line is looking better to me than the one i had farther up the belly the belly comes down same thing on this bird the belly comes down yeah good to go back and forth i'm glad chris is controlling that camera for us so we ideally can go back and forth remember this might you might consider this just a practice today and when you're actually working on your piece if you want to enter the, the contest or have a more finished work of art um, you will actually have you know your your reference right next to you whether it's something you've found on the phone or in a guidebook or combination of references i often when i'm doing an animal i look at a whole bunch of different references because one might be really good for seeing the head and the beak but another reference might be really good for seeing the feet for example the reference we're looking at right now isn't great for seeing the feet we can kind of see them okay next we're going to jump to the feet so notice where the legs come out of the body. It's not super far forward. It's back probably a little closer to the tail than you might think. And it, the legs come out at about a 45 degree angle from the body. One leg is closer to you and one leg is further away. But now we're going to sketch in those legs and they're wider where they join the body and they're narrower where they come down to the ankle. And they have, if it's gripping this bird, like in my case, I've decided my bird's gonna be gripping a, a branch of a tree. If it's gripping the branch of a tree, you have a kind of a, a toe coming forward and a sharper claw coming off of that toe. And then you have a toe that comes around the back of the branch and grips from the back side. At this point, I'm gonna find it helpful to actually sketch in roughly where my branch is. So the foot is actually gripping something. So I'm gonna go like that. And maybe there's another branch. I gotta do the other leg too. So there's two legs, right? There's a leg that's closer to you and a leg that's coming out that's a little further from you, but it's also gripping the branch with the toe and the claw. The other one I'm not really gonna see in this case, it's gonna go behind. Now, how am I gonna make my other bird connect? Uh, I better figure out where the legs would be first. So my, my other bird, I'm gonna similarly make it about 45 degree angle, 45 degree angle with the back foot, and I'm gonna do where the foot, the toe, remember I called it the toe and the claw, curves around the branch, toe and the claw. Same thing here, the toe and the claw and the behind. Okay, so how am I going to make these two branches join? Hmm, I'm going to think about that. Maybe one joins this way and this, maybe this is a smaller branch and maybe this branches off more, branches this way, and it's gonna, I'm gonna let it go right off the page. I'm gonna make another branch down this way. Here you can be creative. How is this branch gonna fill the picture space? Because we can't just have the bird hanging out in the middle of the page. It all has to be, you know, where is the bird? And it has to be believable. So what are we going to do with this? That's a bit of a puzzle, huh? So I, in this case, I'm going to let it, I don't want it to be too distracting, but I'm going to let it go behind and then one branch. Ooh, I don't like that. That's too much. I'm going to erase that and instead make it come in a more graceful curve this way. And then maybe the other branch disappears behind, something like that. Oops, this has to go somewhere, right? This has to go somewhere and that has to go somewhere. So we have a, a bit of a tree scene with two birds sitting on it. I'm still not liking this branch up here. I'm feeling like it's too distracting. I'm going to get rid of that. And let's pretend like this branch bends this way and maybe goes behind. A little better. Okay, so let's go back to the slideshow and check out these birds again. What are we missing here? We 
need to, uh, okay, erase any unnecessary guidelines. We've done some of that. Color the eye black. I mean, if you want, you could start to work with color pencils, but I'm not going to yet. I'm just going to make sure that I rem I, I'm going to eventually come back and color that with colored pencils. But for now, I think we're going to go to the next slide and get inspiration for different ways that artists um, have decided to use this branch idea with their birds. So the ones on the left and the one on the right, those are artworks from our museum's collection here at the National Museum of Wildlife Art. Francois Martinet um, did a different kind of tanager. There are several types of tanager. Th that is not the same one that we have here in Wyoming. It's not the Western tanager. But what I really want you to look at is the composition. In other words, how are things arranged in the picture space? So notice how, in this case, there are two birds. One is facing right and one is facing left, which makes for a really nice composition. Notice the one closer to you is bigger. The one a little bit further from you is smaller because things appear to get smaller as they move back in space. Notice how the branch is done. I really like how that artist has done the branch and has made it really interesting and it leads the eye. It's not too complicated. Mine, as I was sketching, it felt like the branch was getting a little bit too complicated. So that's a great example of how you could fill the picture space. Of course, theirs was vertical and ours is horizontal. So that's a totally different situation. Look at the photograph in the middle. Again, look at, you know, the bird is sitting low down in the branches and it gets skinnier, twiggier, and there's a few leaves kind of coming off of the branch. That could be good inspiration for you. Check out the owls on the right by John James Audubon, the snowy owls. Again, two birds, interesting composition. The one closer to you is bigger. The one further back is smaller. You may decide to do a pair of tanagers, right? You might decide, oh, I want to have a male and a female. If you do that, great. But keep in mind that the coloration is different with the tanager. Um, we've been looking at a male so far with that bright red head and the bright yellow belly. The female, if you do some research and look up how the female looks, it's a much drabber color. There's some olive green. There's some paler yellow um, and some grayish color. So just keep in mind, if you're going to do two birds, like a mating pair, they're not going to look exactly the same. Mine kind of look exactly the same on my sketch so far. So it's like two males sitting on the branch together. And if I decide, you know, if I got inspired by that, uh, by some of those drawings we were looking at together and want to do like aspen leaves, I could have some little twigs coming off. I'm gonna move this down so you can see it. Some little twigs coming off and I wanna fill my picture space with a few leaves. Maybe not too many leaves because it could start to get kind of crazy, but I'm gonna add a few here. Maybe one down here, a little branch coming up with some leaves and another one coming up this direction with some leaves. Now, you might remember that they are in deciduous forests, some, but they're also in conifer forests. So if you ultimately decide that you want a pine tree instead, that's absolutely fine. You could find them in that habitat as well. Okay, let's go to back to our slideshow and look at some more inspiration. The one on the left is a painting we have in our museum from Mark Eberhard, and it's called it's called Cattail Clowns. The bird is a is a a uh, yellow-headed blackbird, I think, and its uh, habitat is in the cattails, which um, is by, you know, you could find cattails by streams, by lakes, but look how the artist has made kind of an abstracted background. He's not showing us way across the lake or into the forest. He's keeping the background pretty simple, and he's just suggesting the cattails around the birds. So, um, you might want to do something similar to that. Look at the photograph on the right. That one is a much busier background. Again, it's the same idea as the bird perched on a branch with, in this case, there are some, 
it's a springtime, lots of leaves. It looks like aspen leaves surrounding the bird. Um, but if you do something like that, that one's a photograph, of course. If I were to use that for inspiration, I would make sure that it didn't get too busy. In other words, the bird is the main focus because this is a contest where we really want to see the bird. So I would clear out some of that clutter of branches and leaves, simplify it a bit if that were my inspiration, and really create an open space around the bird where the, you didn't have branches kind of bisecting the bird, which can make it harder to see what's going on with the bird. So you get the idea. The bird is uh, like is on the stage. You want to see the bird. You don't want the bird to be ob obscured by branches or leaves. And you're the artist. You get to control that. Um, with a photograph, you know, you, you can take a different angle. But with a, you know, drawing or a color, you know, if you're coloring with colored pencils, with paint, whatever you decide to do, remember the bird has to take center stage and you really want to see um, the anatomy and the coloration of that bird without any distraction. Okay, we can go to another slide. And I just wanted to show you some other ideas because, you know, we started drawing on a branch, but it doesn't have to be on a branch. Here's some ideas for the bird closer to the ground. The one on the left is by artist Greg McHuron. Um, this one happens to be a western meadowlark. It could be a tanager if you decide you like, if you like the idea of showing some antlers. You know, it could be deer antlers or elk antlers because um, those are really interesting shapes. Uh, in this case, the bird is perched on an antler instead of being perched on a branch. In this case, the artist is showing a little bit of habitat in the background. You see some colors for the sky. It might be sunset might be a morning sky. You see some, you know, the reddish brown color for the rocks. And then you also see some sagebrush there off to the right hand lower corner. So again, that artist is being true to where this bird is found and what might be growing around that bird. Similarly, if you look at the photograph on the right, again, you see some sagebrush there. And in this case, the bird is on the ground which is not as common to see a tanager on the ground, but you might. So if you like the idea of the bird sitting on the ground, you could do something like that. Again, if I were using that photograph for inspiration, I would definitely make the bird bigger because remember, this is all about the bird. The bird should be the main subject of your work of art. Okay, we can, we can go to um, some other details here. Uh, these are done by a Jackson artist. Her name is Mary Loheis, and she specializes in plants of Wyoming. And you can see here, she also is known for working in colored pencil, which is what we're working in today. So um, look at the, the beautiful colors. She's used several shades of green on the Indian paintbrush there. That could be a really nice addition to uh, one of your drawings. And similarly, the yellow flower could be a nice addition. Another thing while we're on that page is notice, if you can look closely, that she is using a black micron pen, what I mentioned first, this uh, micron pen. This one is a O2 size micron pen. And she is, once she's got all her colors, colored in, she's gone back with this micron pen to, to highlight things and outline things um, just to make them pop and be clearer and more definitions. So for example, if you look at the petals, especially on the yellow flower, you can see the, the petal becomes clearer after it's outlined. Same thing on the Indian paintbrush. You can see the individual petals of the flower have been outlined to show the individual pieces of that flower. Whereas if you didn't have the black outline, it might just all blend together and look maybe more like a dandelion or something. So let's go back to, um, let's go back and do some coloring. I'm gonna do a quick time check here. And it looks like we have some time to do some coloring while you're here. Um, let's just do some coloring. And hopefully we'll go back and forth and Chris ultimately will go back 
um, to, you'll go back and forth maybe a little bit between what I'm doing and what their reference, because they're going to need their reference for the colors. But the belly of these birds is yellow, right? So I'm going to go back to my colored pencils, and you should be coloring as I'm talking. But we're blocking out, initially, we're blocking out some of these main color areas on this bird. I'm noticing that I have to come in and do a better job of erasing because I don't want my guidelines that I put in here before to show so much. Depending on your set of colored pencils, you may have a few different shades of yellow. Maybe you have a really pale yellow and maybe you have a more orangish yellow. I'm gonna color this whole belly yellow to start with, and I'm looking at the same reference that you all are. I'm going to color that nice bright yellow. I'm also going to do that nice bright yellow up and over the head, and it kind of goes up here along the edge, and there's some yellow that continues down a little bit on the nape of the neck. That would be the back of the neck of our bird. And then I'm going to come in with some orange. And I'm going to put, a, I see on this reference here, the belly has a little bit of orange down here. It's more of a pure yellow up higher. And you can put lay one color right on top of the other color there. And I'm also going to use this reddish orange, if you have that color. I'm looking at my face, the patch of color around the face here. Look how much of that. It, I call it red, but it's actually almost a blend of red and orange. I'm going to do some coloring of that. You might be wondering, do I press hard with the colored pencils? Do I press light? Start light. And because you maybe you, you want to be sure that's the right color. And then as you get more confident that, yes, that is the color I want, you could, and I would say, add some strokes, the direction the feathers would grow. So in other words, I'm going out from the eye in an outward and downward motion around the eye, the direction the feathers would actually go like that. I think it's time to add some black around the eye because that eye is a really dark, whoops, just broke my point off my pencil. The eye is a really dark black. And on the same, again, I'm looking at the same reference you're looking at. I'm gonna outline darkly under the eye and above the eye. What color would you say the beak is there? Uh, looks like almost a grayish brown color with a tiny bit of yellow, right? A tiny bit of yellow maybe right here. But for the most part, it's a brownish, kind of grayish color. And the wing, we haven't talked too much about the coloration on the wing, but the coloration on the wing is, I thought I had black, oh, that's funny. I have dark blue instead of black. Let me find a black here. This might be a better black. Sometimes a dark blue can look just like a black. And I see right on the top of the wing, it's really dark. So this is where I'm going to be pressing the hardest. And again, I'm going to color in the direction the feathers would go. And remember we said there was a yellow patch on the wing? I'm going to add that now so I don't lose it. A yellow bar or patch on the wing and a little bit of yellow on the lower piece of the feathers too, like down here. And then as you get further down the wing, I don't want to lose these distinct separate feathers here. Those are important. And instead of just a rounded edge 
um, here, you can, if you look close, start to see separate feathers. So notice I'm coming in here and I'm defining separate feathers as I go around there and then uh, up the back of the bird. Again, I'm starting light. I can always come in and get darker, go the direction of the feathers. And then the black color continues from the edge of the wing. And this is gonna be from the edge of the wing right down the tail. So this is all black here. And it's easy to lay black over another color. So if you found that you, you know, have some yellow you need to cover up, that's easy to do. Trying to maintain separation of feathers again at the end of the tail to show that that is what's happening there. Now I'm noticing that I have some yellow under the tail, right? So here, and almost some reddish color under there too. I'm gonna layer some of this reddish color over the yellow color. And then I'm gonna go, the, again, the direction the feathers would go on the bird to show some of that. I'm gonna get a darker yellow. Let's see, do I have a darker yellow? Kind of like that. Okay, what color are the legs? Grayish or brownish color. I'm gonna use this one. The shade in the legs. Start to add some color there. Wanna see that divide between the beak here. Now I'm gonna show you how that, you know, once I'm hmm, gonna add a little more yellow, I'm noticing up by the eye or orange rather, up by the eye. And then the branch it's on, kind of a brownish color here. So again, you start light, right? You start light because you can always come in with texture and details later and get darker. And I'm going, notice I'm coloring the direction the branch goes. I'm not like going this way here. I'm going the length of the branch. So I'm using the side of my pencil to kind of go the length of the branch. Similarly, oh, I just realized I couldn't figure out, remember I couldn't figure out which direction I wanted this branch to go. I'm gonna let it go that direction because you always wanna fill your picture space and make it you know, not too crowded in any one place. Give it some breathing room. And you can start to finish, you know, start to continue with the branches here. This branch. This branch. And we talked about, you know, adding little bits of of color for the leaves. I'm gonna check out some of these colors I have in my box and get a greenish color. And if this is an aspen type tree, I'm gonna have, whoops, press too hard and it breaks. But there it's a roundish leaf for if it's an aspen tree and it comes to a point. And then again, start light coloring in, and then I can come darker with the veining in the leaves like that. Start light and then come in darker with some of that veining. Similarly up here, a roundish leaf that comes to a point for the aspen. Start light. 
add the veining. Similarly here. Round coming to a point. So you can see how that is starting to fill, fill the picture space over here. I, I'm feeling like I do like the idea of two birds. I think if I just had one, I didn't make it big enough to fill the picture space, which is why I needed two birds. And, you know, I might want to do a little bit of research and, and I might decide this is going to be a female, in which case I'm going to probably make a little bit of changes with exactly where the coloration is so I can have a male and a female together. You know, what about the background? You might be asking yourself, you know, what do I just leave it white? What do I do with the background? Well, if you remember when we looked at um, the, when we looked at the images from the museum's collection, some of them had, you know, sky colors in the background. Some of them had, you know, like a blurred forest in the background. For example, I might decide to color it green just to give the impression that there are more trees and more leaves, but I'm not gonna draw all of those trees and leaves because it's gonna get way too busy. Um, something about two birds I'm looking at here. And you know what, now that I'm looking at it, I know I drew the two birds in the same exact position, but I'm not liking that right now. It's looking too stiff. So I might find a reference where one bird has its wings up, like it's just landed and it's still trying to get its balance. Maybe you can see the other wing from the back. Isn't that much more interesting? And I could still have, you know, the shoulder patch of those feathers here and the primary feathers you know, like that, I can still get all my details in. Again, I'd want to look at a reference to be sure I'm right about that. But look how much better that is in terms of the interest. If it was two identical birds, it got a little bit boring, right? But when I added the other bird with its wings out, all of a sudden it's like, oh, okay. Not only does it fill that space better, but it looks more realistic, right? How often are you going to find two birds in the exact same position? Once in a while, but it looks a little more natural to have it that way. So, um, Chris, what next? Should we switch to talking a little bit more about the contest and what people should do if they're getting it? excited by this and they want to keep working on their own time and coming up with a nice design for the contest, what should they know next? Yeah, absolutely, Jane. Thanks for the great tutorial. And uh, I appreciate all the details that uh, you demonstrated. It's really important in this to not only think about the bird, but the important habitats that they need to support uh, the species. That's all part of the fun of the contest. And so student artists who are interested in entering the competition can submit their artwork um, digitally through an online form and you'll see a link being shared in the comments here shortly um, so once you're once you have your artwork where you like it and you're ready to submit it go ahead and um, take a photo or a high quality scan and enter it in there and um, the artwork is due on april 10th I think you have a slide uh, with that deadline. So let me go up there just so people can see it. Um, so get those submitted before um, April 10th at 5 p.m. And then there are several different grade level categories. So the categories are kindergarten through second grade, third through fifth grade, sixth through eighth grade, and ninth through 12th grade. So just fill out the form, select your grade level category, um, and then when we announce the winners, um, the first place for each grade level category is $150, second place is $100, and third place is $50. So it's a great opportunity to, um, you know, be rewarded for your efforts. I think there's a lot of joy in um, developing your skill and learning how to express your self artistically and then of course it's a great way to learn more about some of the unique uh, species that call wyoming home so um, it's a, a great opportunity and um, jane i guess is there anything else you'd like to say before we wrap up here 
Yeah, mostly what I what I'd like to say is practice. Everybody can get good at drawing. It just takes a lot of practice. So if you don't like what your your first attempt, don't be discouraged. Keep going back and drawing more. Anyone can can get really good at drawing if they put a lot of time into it. Also, get inspired. Go out and look at birds in motion, outdoors, see how they hold their bodies, see how their legs angle out from their bodies, um, see what they look like in flight. You can know you might decide to do one bird in flight and another one sitting on a branch. Go to museums like our museum, other museums, look at references online, not only photographs, but also other artists' work. But just remember, it needs to be your work. Ultimately, get inspired by other people's things, but make it your own. Absolutely. And I think one of the great parts about this year's species being the Western Tanager is you really have a lot of great color to play with too. So um, definitely embrace the brightness and the vibrant colors of the Western tan Right. And, and, you know, we worked in colored pencil today. It's perfectly fine to keep working in colored pencil. But if you prefer watercolor or marker, that's all allowed as well. You don't have to work in colored pencil. Absolutely. And um, yeah, as Jane mentioned, the National Museum of Wildlife Art is open six days a week, Tuesday through Sunday. And then uh, once the spring summertime rolls around, it's open seven days a week. So definitely pay them a visit. It's a great way to become inspired by artists' interpretation of local wildlife, um, which we definitely appreciate here at Wyoming Game and Fish. Thanks for uh, showcasing Wyoming's wildlife in such an engaging way. Um, and it's a great way to experience uh, art from around the world as well. So um, thank you so much for sharing your uh, tips and tricks uh, on this live stream, Jane. We've really appreciated having you. She was here last year as well. So uh, she's been here every year that the student contest has been a part of the um, Conservation Stamp Art Show. So we really appreciate your time. And um, again, for more information on how to enter the Conservation Stamp Art Show, um, go to the Get Involved page on the Wyoming Game and Fish Department's website and click on Conservation Stamp Art Show. There'll be links in the comments, but thanks so much for joining us.